To get started turning our parser into a decoder, the first thing we're going to do is change up the notation we're using to declare parsers just a little bit. We want Hammer's grammar declaration syntax to give you all the information you need to know about a parser up front, so we have another simple macro style for declaring rules with or without semantic actions or Boolean validation checks attached to them. To use it, we have to include glue.h. And now, instead of declaring a pointer and assigning to it, we're going to change lines that are written like this To lines that are written like this, an h rule macro with the name of the rule and the body of the rule. Let's just do that throughout the file and rerun to confirm it still works. Now, we need to change this line a little bit because we have to assign the singleton separately. And now we recompile. and run. And the tests still pass. We know that we can translate any valid block of four base64 characters into three binary octets. So let's attach some actions to do that translation. We'll take our three rules that recognize valid blocks of four characters, b64 3 oct, b64 2 oct, and b64 1 oct, and have them use the ha rule macro instead. When you use this macro, the preprocessor declares an h action function for you, and you'll need to implement it in your code. That means we need to add three function bodies. An h action is a function pointer with a signature like the ones you see here. It takes a successful parse result as an argument, and it returns a token derived from that parse result. You can think of this token as an event, like an input to a state machine. The primitive parsers we've defined, like hch or hint8, output predefined token types, and you can also define your own types that you can transform predefined types and structures of those predefined types into, then send them to the next piece of your code to dispatch the correct behavior for that input. Let's see how that works as we fill in these function bodies. All these translations, whether it's three octets, two, or one, involve an operation on a lookup table. Let's write some code to generate that.
The lookup table in the RFC is the encoding lookup table. So that's the inverse of the lookup table we need for mapping base64 alphabet characters to values between 0 and 63, that is to say, 6-bit values. Each of our action functions will translate characters into 6-bit values and combine them into 3, 2, or 1 octets of output. To get those 6-bit values, we need to populate the lookup table so that we can just look them up. And we'll do that programmatically by inverting the inverse lookup table. We're doing this at runtime, but you could just as easily generate the same lookup table and bake it into your source. First, we initialize all the values in the lookup table to a failure value. In this case, the maximum value a car can hold, since 0 is one of the values that we want to be looked up. Now we iterate through the inverse lookup table by position and use the value we find there as an index into the lookup table. So the character in position 0 of the inverse lookup table is capital A, which means the 41st position of the lookup table gets reset to 0. When it gets to the 90th element in the lookup table for capital Z, it'll set that to 25, which is the corresponding number in the base 64 alphabet. And then the next six elements in the lookup array get left at 255 because they don't appear in the base 64 alphabet. Number 26 is lowercase a, and the value 26 is set for the 97th element, and so on and so forth. Since we'll be using the lookup table within the parser, we'll initialize it when we initialize the singleton. Let's implement the one octet case first, because it's simplest. All we have to do is translate one base64 character into six bits, and the next one into two bits. We know that we'll be returning an octet, and Hammer provides a token type for that, called ttbytes. First, let's take a quick look at the hparse token struct to understand how token creation works. hparse token is a discriminated union type. Its first field is a value defined in the H token type enumeration, which we'll take a closer look at shortly. Its next field is a union, and this union contains all the primitive types that the primitive parsers can parse, like byte arrays, signed integers, unsigned integers. It also has a sequence type to hold the results of sequence parsers, like H many and H sequence, and even a user defined type for when you need your semantic actions to return custom data structures. All we need to deal with is bytes, and we can see the h byte struct just above h parse token. It consists of a pointer to a const array of bytes and the size of that array. That pointer is const for a reason. Since this is C and you have to do your own memory management, normally you'd use malloc here to create your byte array and assign it to that pointer. But Hammer uses an arena allocator to keep memory nicely isolated inside threads. And since this is C, you'll be using that allocator instead of standard malloc. HArena malloc takes a pointer to the arena, which the hparse result argument to this action brought with it, and the size of memory and bytes to allocate. At the end of the function, we know we'll be returning an hparse token of tt bytes type with our octets array as the token value, so we'll use the hmakeBytes constructor macro to put that together. And we can go ahead and do the same for the other two actions, because we know they'll produce two and three octets, respectively.
We defined the B64 one-oct rule as an H sequence of B64 car, B64 car 2-bit, and two padding characters. And if we look inside the hammer header file for the token type that H sequence produces, we see that its token type is TT sequence. And there's an accessor function for accessing the elements of a sequence as an array of H parse tokens in the include file glue.h, so we'll use that. So we're pulling those elements off of the abstract syntax tree that is a parse token embedded in the parse result. We used HCH and HCH range to make up the rules that make up our base64 alphabet rule, and all of those have TTUint as a token type. which means that our array of h parse token pointers is also an array of TTUint tokens. We know that six bits of our octet are going to come from the first character that we parsed in this block. and two of them are going to come from the second character in the block. The uint field is from the union type in the hparse token. The first two bits of our first character aren't used, so we shift the six bits we want to the left by two. And the two bits that we want from the second character are currently at the fifth and fourth positions in the second character, but we want them as our low order bits, so we right shift this character by four, knowing that the first two bits of it weren't used, so it'll all be left padded with zeros. Then we just OR these together into a single octet, the first octet of our return array. Now we want to do something similar for the two octet case, and in fact we can follow the same pattern to the same extent that we'll just copy the entire function body and add the code for the additional octets. We have four bits remaining unused from the second character because we used its two high bits earlier. So we'll shift those and the zeros in front of them off the block by shifting them to the left, which conveniently puts the four remaining bits in place as the high order bits of our octet. And the four low order bits of our octet come from the fifth, fourth, third, and second bits of the third character we parsed. If there were a fourth alphabetic character, bits one and zero would pair up with it to form another octet, but since there isn't, they're padding. So we shift them right to put bits five through two in the low order position of the output octet. And now we can duplicate this in our three octet action.
I'm not a fan of this kind of code duplication, so one thing for you to think about is how you might refactor this. But for the time being, let's get this working. Like I said before, those two lowest order bits from the third character become the two highest order bits in the third octet. So we'll bump them up with a left shift. And then OR that together with the lookup table value of the last character. Since its maximum value is 63, we already know its two highest order bits are 0. And now, all three of these actions are translating already validated four character blocks of base64 encoding into their binary equivalent. We know that the blocks are valid because they parsed successfully. But we can also write some tests to confirm that these rules are doing their jobs correctly at this stage of things before we've even written an action to concatenate the octet sequences together into the completely decoded octet string. In fact, we've already written them. We'll just have to modify them a little bit. We're going to use a different test macro this time, one that compares the computed value of a token to an expected output value. But first, we have to temporarily expose the subparsers that we want to test against. Then, like we did with assigning base64 main to the base64 parser pointer, we expose the 1, 2, and 3 octet parsers into temporary pointers that we'll get rid of later. We're just using them now to help with our testing. And now we can write our tests over these components of the larger base64 parser. Each test will parse a four-character piece of input and create an output token of the appropriate number of octets. And we use glibs assertions to check the properties of the output token. First, we run the b64 3 octet temp parser that we declared over this four character input block, zm9v. We check to make sure that the token type of the result is tt bytes. And then we do a byte-for-byte -byte comparison using memcomp. Since memcomp returns 0 on success, that's what the assert checks for. Both of these gassert functions are ones that glib provides. If you're using a different test framework, you'll need to use its comparator functions. Notice that we're using the same test case that we used before with gcheck parse OK in the 3-octet case. 
We won't be able to handle anything more than six octets until we write that other semantic action I mentioned to glue these parse results together. So let's reuse the one and two octet test cases to make sure we're getting the correct output there. Then we add those to the registry. Since we're including some extra functionality from glib in our tests now, we also need to include the glib header. And then we compile and run. And everything passes. That wasn't very many test cases, but it's a good sign that our lookup table is working correctly. Now, to assemble all the octet fragments into a single output array, we need to write one more action. We'll change our top-level rule, base64 main, to an HA rule. And then stub out its action. The base64 main rule calls for a sequence of zero or more three octet blocks followed by either a two octet block or a one octet block. And we know that the semantic actions attached to the block level rules produce bytes tokens that we can pull right out of the AST. So we can get a sequence of those tokens in order, but to do that, we have to flatten the nested sequence because the many combinator that we used in the base64 main rule also produces a sequence. With this done, we have a continuous sequence of TT bytes tokens. We can find out how many there are with another sequence successor. And we know that the size in bytes of the output will be at most three times the number of blocks and at least three times the number of blocks minus two. So now we can just loop through the sequence and accumulate all the octets into an array we know is big enough. Similar to hseq elements that we used earlier, hseq index is an accessor function for sequence tokens, but it returns a single element rather than an array of them. 
Now we copy the decoded octets from the hparse token into our output buffer. We'll use memcopy, so we have to pound include string.h. We're copying into the octets buffer starting at the jth position, which starts off at zero. We're using the bytes union value from the hparse token, and we're copying len bytes off of its token value. Then we increment j by the number of octets we just added. Now we need to create the token we're returning, which is also bytes. And this creates a TT bytes token containing exactly J octets, discarding any that went unfilled in the octets buffer. Then we return it. Now we have everything we need to do the same kind of tests we just ran on the block level parsers on the full base 64 parser. We'll have them parse the six, five, and four octet test cases we used before. And we can also change the 1, 2, and 3 octet examples to use the main base 64 parser for good measure. Then we can get rid of these temporary rules. Register the four, five, and six octet tests. Then we compile and run our test suite. And look at that. The top level parser is doing everything we need to decode base64 strings. So if what we really want is a base64 decoder, then we're going to want to change this main function into something that reads input from standard in and sends its decoded output to standard out. Let's refactor our test suite out of our code into its own file and leave this one for the implementation.
We'll include Base64.c in its entirety for now, and we'll move main over as is. And then we'll take the test-related lines out of main in our implementation, along with the test cases in the test case registry. Also, we don't need to include the test suite header over here anymore. Or glib. So we'll allocate a suitably large input buffer to be read into from standard in. Then we'll read from standard in one byte at a time into the input buffer until end of input. Here, fread will tell us the number of bytes we read because we're reading them one at a time. Next, we parse the input we read. Now, if the input decoded successfully, we'll output it to standard out and return 0. And if it didn't, the parse result will be null, so we'll return 1 in that case. Now we can actually test this on the command line. Since we've moved our testing code over to its own file, we don't need to link against glib anymore. Since base64 doesn't expect a trailing new line, we'll use echo-n to pipe input to it. And it writes the six octets it decoded to standard out. That's it. You now have a working base64 decoder. Take a breather, pat yourself on the back, grab a cold one out of the fridge. You've just written a piece of software that will either succeed unambiguously on good input or fail unambiguously on bad input in just over 100 lines of C. Not a lot of software can lay claim to that, but we've only just gotten started. In the next module, we'll build on what we've already learned about Hammer from implementing Base64 and the implementation we just finished to build our JSON RPC server with a few extra tricks up its sleeve. Until then, Think about what kinds of semantic actions you'd need to attach to the octets parser you wrote after the last video to turn it into a Base64 encoder. You can reuse the lookup table we wrote in this video for your encoder and pretty much the same main function as well. Try writing a B64 encode implementation to match your B64 decode, and I'll see you next time.